then we should be beginning. Let's do it. And just uh, figure out everything on the fly. Welcome, everyone, to the Season 79 SBA Entry Draft. This year, we're joined by not Tomato, but Nepto only by himself. Hello, Nepto. Hey, everyone. Hope you're doing well. I think we got a big draft ahead of us. So, let's get to it. Yeah, we definitely have 20 or even more than 20 players to go. And a lot of them are somewhat high profile. So, on the screen currently, you can see the provisional draft order where we have Chicago Nightmare at the top after winning the lottery. Uh, I believe that was their own selection and not the one from uh, whichever was Milwaukee. But uh, yeah, Chicago sit at the top and Vancouver Wolverines after their, was it 1 and 81 season, uh, ended up at second place in the draft lottery. So maybe karmic justice for winning that one game against the Oklahoma City Rampage. But... Uh, They'll be happy picking so high. Then you have Milwaukee, Oklahoma City Rampage by themselves. And then it's uh, Brooklyn, Boston, Seattle, Pittsburgh at 8th after their great season. And uh, Brooklyn again at 9 and Chicago again at 10. So, obviously, uh, something we've been having a bit of jokes about is uh, Houston Ravens all, all, always being in the top 8, top 5, even top 3, there or thereabouts. They did not win the SBA championship this year, actually were eliminated in the... Uh, I guess it's the first, um, yeah, second round. Second round of games uh, by the Miami Vice and... Uh, Looking at the draft board right now, they don't hold a pick in the entry draft. Uh, what's your thoughts on the Houston Ravens and if they'll be secure in their future still? I mean, it's always nice to see someone else at the top, though I think the Jokers are approaching the territory of the Ravens as well. So that they are the same old team at the top uh, winning those championships. But for the Ravens, I think they traded out of last season's draft, or they picked someone up and traded them soon after, right? Yes. Um, I think they still have a couple of young players that are going to grow and be there for the foreseeable future. Maybe they will make another move to get some of their aging stars out, as we have seen back in the 40s. And mm -hmm. You probably remember Chill's bullets and... Uh, being very adept at trading away their stars in the last years for high draft uh, capital to keep the machine rolling. So, would not be surprised to see it, but uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, like something I also mentioned last year is that the Las Vegas Jokers are, like you insinuated, approaching the uh, Houston Ravens territory somewhat, but also, this uh, draft board here is a, another season in a row where they don't have a pick. So it's not necessarily uh, the same, because this is at least with off years or years off uh, of the machine, machine churning. Uh, so you <clears throat> used to see all the time, uh, like last season, like you said, it was Danny Williams. Uh, Houston picked and then just send him to Mexico City, I think, immediately after. And yeah, having years off where you don't have a premium young player coming through, where you could extract value and you actually like have aging star players, like in this case it's Rashida Ryder, Count Olaf for Houston, and then Young Boy SBA, uh, and I guess like Sh Shaquille Schwill. Or, well, Shaquille is not that old. About I mean, Las he's Vegas. the same age as Young Boy SBA, but yeah, 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 a different player type. So 
but not be subject to that much regression yeah. right away. Yeah, yeah, but if you're not like uh, stocking up the coffers uh, on the side, then you still have just those two players. And uh, yeah, you can do a lot of things with uh, two good players and town reading also for the Las Vegas Jokers. But yeah, it remains to be seen if the there's um, surprisingly more parity incoming in the league. Uh, I could see Jokers with their uh, crop of players having a nice little bit of run here for a couple of years at or around the top of the league. But yeah, uh, let's move on to the entry draft itself here after doing all the um, ESPN like uh, why are they always talking about the Lakers and the Knicks. Uh, so we had to get our bit of uh, Houston and Las Vegas there on the broadcast as well. Before we get to the first overall selection, we have it moving or changing hands. Uh, the Milwaukee Maulers are acquiring uh, the selection from Chicago for a the third overall selection and a future Milwaukee first rounder. Um, yeah. I think in a draft like this, where you have so many fantastic options to choose from, I think this price is sort of cheap, but also fair, because maybe Chicago doesn't have their, like, um, they didn't have that optimal pick to make it choose from, and Milwaukee wanted to secure the first overall selection, not to be overdone by two or overtaken by the two selections ahead of them. Uh, do you agree there, or do you have? Yeah, not, not a lot. I think Milwaukee obviously wanted someone specific. Chicago did not seem to do so. I think we had a similar situation where you got picked up back then with the Aviators. I think the trade was very similar, like dropping down from one to three and attaching one pick for the troubles, which could turn into something, most likely not. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like uh, Chicago is sort of giving away the optionality, and they'll pick the best player who's left of the at three. Uh, that's what it seems like to me. But let's see what Milwaukee are selecting. Uh, yeah, quickly here is the order after the trade. Obviously, with a bit of mental um, work there, you could figure it out for yourself. And the first overall selection uh, will be Fire Ilo Hetta. And I think this is the first uh, Sami player in SBA history for sure. Not sure if that's actually canon, but uh, I'll believe it uh, based on the name. So Schnitzel's uh, seven foot one center uh, out of the Quar City Asylum. A defensive uh, star so far in his young career had a Great, great uh, season, racking up steals and blocks in the SPTL. What do you think about this selection then for Milwaukee? Is it worth the jump to secure this player for your future? Depends on the play style they were chasing. Um, obviously, Milwaukee has been lacking a good big since, ever, since their old duo of uh, BRM and Carter has been retiring or traded off due to age uh, so picking up a big is crucial for them but there's a lot of great picks out there i like to the pick overall for them it's a great defensive pickup for a team that has established stars on offense but would they have needed to move up to secure someone right here not sure but they like the pick and i think they're doing to do great with it yeah. How about you as a residential center player? I think the uh, only thing that makes this any sort of interesting is that they still do have Shibui Kakara, I think, on their team, who is a center-only player and started out as a uh, defensive sort of anchor player, which are actually, yes. I yes. don't think he's on the team, is uh, he? just finished the season on the team at least oh okay i mean there hasn't been a lot of development with him so i yeah don't suppose yeah. that he will be prioritized over any 
Yeah, I think talent. coming into the league, uh, Isla Heta is going to be like just as good already as the soon to be third year Akara, which is sort of a shame, but also like good enough insurance. And uh, if you have much more confidence in uh, uh, this uh, new player's future, then I think it's uh, fair to go with that one. Yeah, uh, Milwaukee will be in a interesting spot for the future after just barely missing the playoffs this year when my player was there in his prime and now after having retired Benny Boy uh, there's a big sort of like gap to be filled. I'm not <laughs> gonna uh, pose as my player would have been like some sort of like a world beater but still it's a a lot of resources allocated to a player that's just now gone uh, for nothing. But yeah, best of luck to Ilo Hetta in uh, Milwaukee and let's move on. to The second overall selection. Woohoo! That's me. Uh, I've been saving for this moment for like nine months at this point. So I'm just gonna say his name completely wrong for the joke that it is. So, with the second overall selection, the Vancouver Wolverines are selecting Neoli Meijer Rahat. And, uh, yeah, I played for the Ducks and Hyenas last season and uh, just had a well-rounded offensive game without not much extra there. And Vancouver, like we were just uh, mentioning, uh, won one game all season and didn't also have pretty much anything going for them uh, last season so they were fairly surely all just banking on this uh, draft and the future drafts so what do you think about the future of the Vancouver Wolverines is it a well I can give you this much uh, to go off on uh, I don't think a shooting guard player like mine would be in vogue immediately so a couple seasons just like grinding away, uh, developing the further core of the team should be fine by me. And I haven't played for Jeff ever. And I think it's a good opportunity to play for him. But what do you think uh, starting the sort of rebuild and starting the core with a sh shooting guard small forward player for Vancouver Neto? I mean, I, as someone who has finished just finished a 10-year career as being that rebuilt starter for Vancouver the last time around, um, I think it's a good good fit. It reminds me a bit of the prior to that worst Wolverine season, I think when they just got announced as an expansion team with 478 or something like that. And back then they picked up Joe Cooper or... I believe they did only after that season. Mm. So I can see some similarities here, both scoring heavy wings um, who can have a lot of touches, a lot of individual success right out of the gate while the team is built around them. So I think this is a good match for both of you going forward. Yeah. In terms of the player profile, I, I don't know when the player store changes are going to come through, but I would also be very interested in removing the eligibility to play small forward and just have like uh, that sort of an old school uh, shooting guard player from the past of the SBA, like a prolific player in that vein where you don't do any funny stuff like uh, with positional eligibility or even being a freak from the past because I somehow have always just refused all that um, so-called meta stuff so i guess we'll see how good a player in this position can actually be i don't know and i don't really like the position but i'm very excited to actually do something uh, that's out of the norm for me for a, for a while yeah then with the third overall selection the chicago nightmare are selecting scotty russell uh this one is interesting to see uh, the league owner Molhold back in the fold and 
even in very familiar colors to himself, of course, had a lot of good times with uh, Evans in Chicago in the past and now with Coffey as the general manager for Chicago. Shouldn't be too much different. I'm not saying Coffey is maybe as good as Evans or anything like that, but that's sort of that old guard uh, talking there. Uh, what do you think about Moholt returning as a player to the SBA? It will be very interesting to see Mo. I think his last player retired seven, eight seasons ago. Something along those lines with McGriff, right? Yeah, maybe um, more even. No, I think around seven, eight, because he was around in Vancouver when JFJ was already on there. So it cannot be that long ago. Oh, okay. Um, but this time it's not a Mac player. The last Mo player that wasn't a Mac player that we got was Sky Terry. Mm -hmm. who was basically just there to shoot the most free step he can. And I'm curious if Scotty Russell will follow a similar trend or if we will see a throwback to his first and only point guard player prior to Sky Terry. Um, that was Michael McGrady, who is in the Hall of Fame. So very intrigued to see what place he's going to, to choose for himself, especially as he is going to be my teammate in mm -hmm. the next season at the Nightmare. Yeah. It's actually interesting uh, indeed because um, the career arc in terms of players from Mollholt has been quite fun, of course, where you have the best players in SBA history and then they turn into more ex experimental players who are fun and weird and some consider them to be gimmicks, but they're also very good with uh, McMahon and then, well, I guess Terry and McGriff are sort of in between. <laughs> but yeah this is very interesting to see if these are like actual like so-called tryhard players or if there's something interesting uh like a sort of new player build that's gonna come up so i'll be very interested in keeping an eye out on uh the mohawk players that are gonna come through in this draft for sure Then, with the fourth overall selection, we go to Oklahoma City Rampage, who are selecting David Smith, who the fuck, Jr. Uh, apologies for That's the swear no words. <laughs> yeah, if That's you're no listening joke. with uh, children around. But, uh, yeah, David Smith Jr. of the Overlord D8 uh, agency played for the Fort Lauderdale Lightning last season. So, you have, uh, or you know him well. And... Yeah, I guess you also sort of maybe know Oklahoma City virtually well. So what do you think about this pickup now for the Rampage? I honestly saw him as one of the prime candidates for first overall pick. Mm -hmm. um, because first of all, Overlord is a great guy. And I think anyone who's had him as a teammate can, can vouch for that. And second of all, um, there's not a lot of small forwards power forwards uh, well there's a lot of power forwards but not that many small forwards in the draft in general and then having someone who does everything that you want him to do on the floor that is not i want the ball at all times um is always great to have and it's always attracting star players uh, to want to play with him so great pickup for for okc how do you see it yeah i'm not sure if i like this sort of a player build for uh, this positional eligibility that much because uh, of course it's good but uh, after years and years and at this point like decades of SBA basketball I just feel like the power forward position has such a high ceiling that uh, doing some sort of like well deviating from the so-called standard build plans uh, sometimes can lead to disappointment um maybe not disappointment compared to your expectations and if you're set on your plans uh you can do whatever of course but just like when you watch the guys around you'd be sometimes thinking like why am i not like why did i not just do a normal player build <laughs> but yeah uh i still uh, mostly agree that uh, it should be a very good teammate to have uh not only as the person, 
oh yeah, I guess he's my general manager in Arizona, but also like as a player type with this sort of skill set with shooting, passing and defense and not that much high usage ball hogging. Then, actually we do have a trade here. Uh, the Bullets are receiving Jordan Hatfield from the Miami Vice. And Jordan Hatfield was in an interesting position. Well, most of the Miami Vice team was in an interesting position. Where in the regular season it felt like you had too many players. And not enough like uh, playing time on offer for most of your uh, promising players. And Jordan Hatfield ended up playing the entire season off the bench. Backing up Zaltan Wu. And the depth of their shooting guard eligible players, Benson, Pagano, that sort of players. So getting a move to a team where you might be able to start afterwards, that's going to be good. And fifth overall selection, we're still in that range where you have like high premium players to pick up. So I think it's all in all pretty fair. What do you think about Hatfield moving to Brooklyn? Great pickup for Brooklyn because I think their major trouble, which made them miss the playoffs last season, was their defense. And Hatfield is a great defender, um, at least on a man to man basis and rebounding. So expecting us to, to pay off for them. I don't see any rookie moving the needle if they want to contend right now. Um, they maybe could have used someone to pair him with Arunas or Bonas for the foreseeable future. But right now, good pick. And for Miami, I think they've made a lot of moves this offseason already now. Um, so there seems to be a big, not a rebuild, but refurnishing going on. Um, and excited to see what we end up with at the end of the night. Yeah, uh, just to give a little perspective on that one, Miami made previously this week four trades or three, maybe four. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, mentioned Zoltan Wu is now out. Uh, Thomas Andrich is now out. Uh, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Well, you'll find all that out later when I gather my thoughts and put it in a more concise manner. But <laughs> you can, <laughs> while you wait for that uh, eventuality that might never come, you can go to SPA.today forums and check out the league transaction uh, sub forum. Uh, here's the uh, board after that trade, so it's been Heita, Hatta, uh, Meyer Rahat, and uh, Scotty Russell before David Smith, and we're moving on to the fifth overall selection where you have Kalo Gida, or Kalo Gida, or Kalo Gida. Well, it's KG21 once again, of course, you could uh, figure that much from the initials. Uh, played for the Belmont Barons, six foot seven shooting guard slash small forward, and uh, yeah, a sort of a bare bones player. Reminds me of like Edward Craven Walker, especially with the Miami Vice logo there on the screen. Uh, yes. How he came into the league, and uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on uh, this pick for uh, basically replacing Hatfield now? Yeah, I think they're very similar in nature now. So, also shooting out small forward with a focus on basically just shooting freeze on offense and having some great defense to back it up. Obviously younger and therefore less developed. Um, but I agree with you in, in general, a lot of similarities also to Craven Walker. So I think Miami is going to continue their game plan that worked for them last season. Yeah, uh, just to mention, if you're not watching the attribute diagram, there's a lot of uh, quickness, high stealing, also developed blocking and fouling uh, for a shooting guard. That's very interesting. And then, of course, uh, a marksman from deep shooting the three point. So best of luck to KG in Miami. And we'll move on to the sixth overall selection, where is his uh, long lost well, I was going to say cousin, but that doesn't really make sense. But it's a uh, uh, sixth of our selection. Uh, the Boston Minutemen are selecting Daryl Bagwell. So uh, EB's a shooting guard slash small forward with a bit of the same characteristics as uh, Gida. 
uh, going to Boston. Uh, what do you think about the key differences between the two players, if there are any? Of course, we can tell a couple, but still, what's the... Well, for once, Gator only switched to his place uh, midway through last season. So he hasn't been at it for, for a lot, and I think you see it reflected in the stats as well. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, Backwell is all about shooting freeze and stealing the ball. The rest does not matter to him. And he did so extremely great. I'm not sure if he finished above 50% from free no. during last season, or barely fell under it. Yeah, um, 600 made three-pointers last season. Yeah, but only only on 49%. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I think, without a doubt, the greatest three-point shooting his, uh, season we've seen in SBDL history. Yeah, so, possibly either leagues, really. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not sure how many times Terry or uh, Claudius Caesar or is it even the right yeah, order yeah, of Claudius the Caesar in Cincinnatus. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't sure if it was Caesar at second or first now. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if they maybe shot more freeze, but at a worse percentage. Either way, he isn't going to shoot that much in the SBA, I assume, mm -hmm. because of the nature of having other teammates who like to score with the ball. Um, but similar vein to, to Gita, good defensive player with some good instant offense uh, relief for any scoring stars. Yeah. I think uh, Bagwell could be an outside candidate for SPDL MVP, actually, but uh, that's not necessarily a point <laughs> we're going to be making on this podcast. So yeah, the key difference is that Bagwell has maxed out the three-point shooting, whereas with Keita it was uh, on its way. And there's no blocking and little bit uh, development in fouling. Whereas with Gada, you had more um, rounded defensive game with the fouling and blocks as well. So that uh, those are the key differences. And we'll see how uh, both of these careers develop. With the seventh overall selection, the Seattle Knights are selecting another super duper star on the SBDL level. It's Cole or Cole. Holy, Holy Clarkson, yeah. Uh, yeah, here's Torkoal as well, dunking the basketball. Uh, power forward slash small forward of the Orbiting Death Agency, so very famed, very successful. Uh, 37 points last season, a, yeah, like I said, a super duper star on the SPDL level. Uh, uh, rounded offensive game, uh, able to do a lot uh, scoring the basketball. Uh, how is the fit in Seattle for Clarkson? Well, it's a bit tough to say since Seattle does not have their final roster yet. A lot of their guys from last season even retired, like uh, Lapa. the newest right um, family member and or have entered free agency. So not exactly sure what the team is going to be there. As of now, I think is a solid fit. Brings a lot of scoring potential while not having the worst so uh, shot selection that you can have. And also a baseline on defense to work around. Will it be enough to be an instant starter for a playoff team with the team right now? I'm not sure. But uh, I don't know. How do you feel about rookies having to carry a scoring load for a playoff contender? I think... Uh... Generally, I would say it's nearly impossible. And in terms of Seattle, uh, like you mentioned, uh, a lot of their previous players are missing and they were already underwhelming last season. So maybe it's rather that they're quite lucky to have a draft pick this high in this draft now. And they can sort of settle into their future more like make an immediate uh, rather than make an immediate push right now. But it's interesting, like for a player of uh, this caliber, you certainly need like 150 more DP to be like acceptable if you're just only offense, I think. So I would say generally I advise against having uh, your rookie be the 
star man on offense. And I don't think it'll be much different for uh, Seattle next season either. They'll have to have someone ahead of him, even if it's like Son Lee's Jack, Lee's, Lee's Jack, or whoever else. I think I think he wouldn't be having the first option over Lee's Jack. I mean, both of them are pretty similar in their shot selection right now, so neither of them is fond of doing of taking a lot of jump shots. So maybe there's a mentor there to to model the game after. Yeah, but. Uh, I agree with you. It's it's difficult as a rookie, um, especially if you're not like one of the high, high, high end rookies, to make a positive impact on offense right away. Yeah, I think there's a dark horse possibility where if Lee Jack is taking all the most difficult shots and like pushing down Lee Jack's own efficiency, uh, then Quali Clarkson as the second uh, like complementary scorer could. Be, could possibly have a, like a really good season and be uh, even challenging for rookie of the year but uh, that's always like I guess pretty tough to foresee uh, at this point before the rosters are even uh, finished for the coming season but yeah interested to see uh, how that uh, little bit of a competition there shakes out next year with the 8th overall selection, the Pittsburgh Ironmen are selecting Dennis Chamberlain. Chamberlain? Chamberlain? Chamberlain. Yes. Uh, another Mac... Wait, that's not a Mac. Uh, Mulholt player entering the draft. Like I alluded previously, there'd be multiple of them. So this is the latter and final one. Yeah, another straight to the draft player going to a team that uh, has very high hopes of their immediate future. Uh, Iron Man were joint number one and uh, on tiebreaker won their own uh, division last season and made it pretty far in the playoffs, losing in the semi-finals to the Vice. With the roster uh, the Iron Man would currently have, is there room for Chamberlain to do something in the immediate or what do you think? I just noticed that Mo and I apparently will be teammates on two teams next season. Um, as for room, I'm not really sure. I don't think it's going to be a starting spot because there is a lot of talent there right now. So he's going to come off the bench. At least that's what I assume. Mm -hmm. But what intrigues me even more is that this player is slightly undersized with six foot one instead of the usual six foot four six foot five we've seen for most guards so yeah. curious to see if that hints at something different um that's planned for his his play style then moving on to the eighth overall selection the brooklyn bullets are selecting volcano sharp so a underrated storyline right now is that even at the picks eighth nine ten you have very reputable people with high TP players, as is sometimes the case. So Jay Cools, shooting guard a small forward out of the Louisville Lions, uh, had an outstanding season in the SPDL last year. But once again, uh, is going to be settling into a team where you have high TP players already and even in the position already. So, I guess with Sharp and um, who's the previous player I'm blanking on now? Uh, which one are you searching for? I'm not sure. If you search for a Hatfield, you just got traded. Yeah, 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 well. yeah. That one. So, I guess they're gonna like split their time at the sh would it be a shooting guard position with Godo, then these two, then Devon then Biggs and then Urbonas. I think that's like sort of fair. And Hatfield, obviously the more um, experienced of the two. So Sharp shouldn't be expecting the starting spot, but also an opposite type of player. So there could be something there. What do you think about Sharp's like player profile and player build? I think Sharp is what you mentioned earlier, like the stereotypical shooting guard build. So 
a lot of good shot making while also having a decent defensive base, especially in the stealing department. Um, so I'm going to, to forecast that he's going to develop in a, in a similar way in the future. Maybe as like the one-two punch of the future with Aruna Sobona then at shooting guard at center, respectively. Um, but I agree with you, not a lot of big time minutes this season, possibly sharing some with with Devon at small forward and then Hatfield at shooting guard. Yeah. Uh, what do you? Uh, I didn't want to mention it because I didn't actually realize if it was true for other players. But with <clears throat> Meyer Rahat and uh, now Sharp here, you already see rookies coming into the league with a developed jump shot attribute. <clears throat> Whereas if you look at some of the year seven, year eight high volume players in the SBA currently. There's still uh, plenty of them with only 35, so unallocated TP, or not allocated any TP into the skill. Uh, what do you think about this sort of new development with already refining some of the jump shooting attribute? I'm not particularly fond of it. <laughs> yeah, well, I <laughs> knew that much, for, but... <laughs> for rookies and, and young players, I think uh, having that jump shot attribute, especially as a tendency, is great if you want to look to get more more volume in to a great scorer, which might be true on the SPDL level especially, but it doesn't translate well into the SBA for young players. And so they will have not a really great shot selection as they could have in their first few years um, until their development catches up with like the heightened level of play at the, at the SBA. So I think it's good for teams that are looking for maybe a spark plug or are in rebuilding mode, so you are not looking for the 100% most efficient shot anyway. Um, but for contenders, I think they're mostly staying away then from those type of players who demand more shots and less efficient shots than they should be taking. Yeah, so generally the idea is still the same for you, that jump shot attribute is reserved for uh, first options and pretty much first options only and sharp uh, is not going to be the first option at least in the <laughs> I guess next four years whereas for Meya Rahat I uh, might already be the first option so it makes a bit more sense then yeah or... yeah for first second even third options maybe get that jump shot if it, if it helps you um but you should be in a position already, especially physically, to make those shots or make the best of those shots. And that's yeah. usually not the case as a rookie because you have some catching up to do with the league. Yeah, I've often just had like very poor jump shot uh, percentages all through my players' careers. And this time when I was, was uh, now making like a score first player, uh, that starts off as a score first player, uh, I didn't want to have that like 29% jump shooting uh, on my resume <laughs> at the end of my career. Even if it would be just one season or two seasons, I just didn't really want it. So I invested some into it and yeah, remains to be seen what comes of it. Might still end up being 29%, but who knows? I don't think so, but you don't want to give the pundits any, any additional talking points. Yeah, definitely gotta <clears throat> uh, remain out of the shot chucking limelight. Uh, the 10th overall selection, the Chicago Nightmare are selecting Vincent Valentine. So another return to the SBA this uh, time around is Doc Holiday. Uh, I think I, I, I'd suggest they're lining up with uh, Molhold's new player careers, but uh, Doc Holiday is Vincent Valentine also headed to the Chicago Nightmare, a power forward slash center, uh, six, 11 so pretty standard there what do you expect from uh dark holidays new player careers do you well i suppose you would but do you uh have you had respect did you like his previous players from the olden times i mean there were a couple of great players for him like for example I hope I don't mix it up again. It was Clyde Alexander back when I joined the league, who was like an upcoming 
point guard and then absolutely dominated at point guard and even one season at small forward. Yeah. Um, and then Doc and I think he even has fame. one more Hall of Fame player before that, right? Yeah, Adrian Columbus. Yeah, I think his last player was was Straw, who was similar in the offense first approach, who had great numbers, but due to not a really great defense, never got a chance on the contender, I believe. So I'm interested to see if this is also going to be an offense first player, especially as it's going to affect my touches, you know? <laughs> um, because we are playing similar positions for the Nightmare now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, really intrigued to see and happy to have Doc back. Now we are just missing Haas as like the, the uh, fourth guy. I guess to 11 too. Oh yeah, and 11. And yeah. 11 to have like those 40, <laughs> 40 yeah. guys back in action. <laughs> but yeah, there's a, this is like a massive sort of throwback in a way, which is pretty cool. We have a trade then to announce about the 11th overall pick. It's uh, headed to Philadelphia and the Aviators are receiving Evan Mullins. So Evan Mullins back back to Charlotte after being traded maybe last draft or the previous draft. I can't remember the Mullins uh, moving around that well because obviously the names are the same. But yeah, this is an interesting one. Uh, which makes it much more interesting moving on to the next uh, uh, screen where you have Evan Mullins going to Boston in trade for his, I think, family member, Trey Mullins. And J.R. Glock also uh, moving to Boston and he'll be exchanged for René Sanku and uh, Knox Bloodfoe. So Aviators getting... 11 for 11th overall and JR Glock they're receiving Rene Sanku, Knox Bloodfall and Trey Mullins. Uh, what do you think about this value proposition? I, I think Minutemen are Glock, winning. <laughs> yeah, I think so as well. I mean, Glock didn't want to be in Charlotte after not wanting to be in Philly mm -hmm. midway for last season, I think so. First he was like, yeah, great Charlotte, then realized there's another guy who wants to take a lot of shots in Charlotte. So he said, yeah, get me out of here again. Um, still a great player, and I think Boston wins this one, because what the Aviators receive, I'm not really sure. Bloodfall has not been developing for the last couple of seasons. He's a solid-ish big, but that's where it stops. Uh, yeah, I think and... he's overrated too. Uh, he looks like he should be good, but I don't think he's ever really performed in like yeah. SBA or FIBA or like anywhere when he's been starting. There's just not been good as of yet. So yeah, I agree yeah. there. And Trenis and Coop has some solid defense. Is a bit, I would say, shaky on the offensive side um, when it comes to taking the right shots. So intrigued what what charlotte does here because other than trey mullins i don't see someone they receive in this trade who's going to help them in the future like maybe someone available at the pick right now could have yes yeah. now at philly the draft board thusly is we're on the bottom end of the first round here and the philadelphia prowlers are on the clock and selecting lamar cage uh, J. Cole's other player, 6'11", power forward slash center, played for the Belmont Barons. Uh, then I can immediately throw it back to you, as you just said, you could have maybe had a player with this uh, pick there. Instead, you turned it into Trey Mullins and the couple uh, other players, Sun Coop and Bloodfall. Do you think you'd rather have Lamar Cage for Charlotte than the other players if it was just you in charge of the... For the aviators, yeah, definitely. I would have loved to have Lamar Cage. He's very well-rounded. He's the type of big who already has some defense, but also some offense. So you can shape him in whichever way you want him to, to become your cornerstone for the future. And Jay Kool is a great guy. So I think this is an absolute steal for the Prowlers to get for relatively cheap. 
Um, how do you feel about it? Pretty much firmly agree. If it was me uh, running the Charlotte Aviators, I would have liked Lamar Cage instead of um, the players you get in return. For Kugmeister, you obviously get the extra benefit, as we've seen in the past few draft episodes, of having your own player and uh, having something you can trust and also something you can trade away uh, without any conscious at all. So all of that also plays a factor in it. But uh philadelphia getting lamar cage instead is a very good pickup for them as they're gonna be well i think i'm not sure but i'll have to check i think it should be quite reasonable for cage to be a strong starter for philadelphia for like the foreseeable future from now until eternity even if possible so yeah i think <laughs> Yeah, I think it's uh, good for both team and player to have Lamar Cage picked here. And only if it was not for the Mulholt players and, uh, well, I guess my players and J. Cole's previous other player, actually. Uh, this otherwise would have been a player sometimes you'd see in the top two, maybe even first overall selection. And here falls all the way to the 11th, 10th. So, yeah, pretty good pickup all in all. With the 12th overall selection, the St. Louis Battalion are selecting Raylan Rousseau. Uh, Raylan Rousseau, another exactly in the same vein as I just finished talking about Lamar Cage, a power forward slash center player with uh, high TP totals, a lot of talent, and Riser has made a couple of very good players previously as well. So you'd be surprised to have a player like this fall all the way to the 12th. But uh such is the such is the uh setup of uh rookies we have coming into the league this season the saint louis battalion have been flying under the radar for a little bit here they had strong seasons but also now are stuck in sort of the morass where they're not as good as la las vegas and houston but not necessarily year to year much better than ocelots inferno uh, miami uh, maulers even, that sort of thing. So, for the St. Louis Battalion's future, uh, what do you think of this um, pickup for them? I really like the pickup. I mean, do you remember when the Battalion were like the all-offense, no-defense team? Yeah. And I think Rousseau being picked here is a sign of change of being like, not the complete opposite, but of thinking, okay, what do we need to win now? Because they have some good players on their roster. For example, Sailor Moon is their first scoring option. Um, and giving Moon a big partner that can defend well, that is inclined to rather pass the ball than score for himself. is yeah. absolutely great. Uh, Russo might have flown under the radar last SPDL season. Didn't make a lot of waves, but I think we'll do very fine on the battalion and could even be a vital piece to them making the playoffs. Yeah, I think what's uh, most interesting is the fact that Tristan Atos and uh, Sailor Moon have this uh, small forward eligibility. Whereas for Sailor Moon to be fully unlocked as an offensive player, I think you'd want uh, a Moon to play center. But then mm -hmm. for Rousseau to be fully unlocked as a defensive player, you'd also want him to play center, I guess. So that's uh, always brings about this very interesting divide where uh, you can put Rousseau at power forward, Atos at small forward, and then Moon at center, but maybe you're not as uh, well-defined and uh, good off defensively. So that brings about a lot of interesting choices for the Matty Live 3K uh, general yeah, manager. A lot of a lot of options to shuffle things around, maybe, especially for the playoffs, if you yeah. want to have a good matchup. Yeah, much so. more matchup oriented if you uh, get there with the, especially if you get a strong seeding. In... Mm -hmm. 13th overall selection, uh, Frankie Valentine uh, headed to the New York Rail. And uh, Frankie Valentine, the second player of Doc Holliday's creation in this draft, a power forward slash center once again. 
What do you think of uh, Doc with two big men going into the draft? Do you... Well, I guess whatever we said 15 minutes ago could just be copy-pasted here, couldn't... Yeah, I think most of it still holds true. I yeah. think the most interesting thing is going to be how New York is going to juggle those minutes because they already have two guys who are locked into the big man spots on their roster, plus a couple of guys who have power forward um, as their second position as well. Yeah. So quite a lot of talent on those positions. So minutes might be hard to come by and happiness for all involved even less. Yeah, um, that certainly can be true. Uh, the biggest difference so far I can tell is that, of course, like you said, on New York, it's not as clear cut. Well, it's not as clear cut in Chicago either, but it's much more convoluted in New York. And then the fact that it's uh, not Keldon Johnson, whereas this is like, or was the previous one was Jeremy Sohan and this is Keldon Johnson? I think so, yeah. Uh, whatever. <laughs> San Antonio Spurs players, regardless. And yeah. Yeah, remains to be seen. Uh, I give this a incomplete out of 10 grade so far. Best of luck to Valentine in New York. And we'll move on to the next one. Uh, 14th overall selection. The Oklahoma City Rampage select DJ Obalambo uh, from the Honey Badgers. Yeah, I think another player of that sort where in a sort of normal or less busy season you'd see them at or around first overall and uh, Obalambo is a like fully profiles as a defensive player and Rampage already having selected earlier in this draft uh, how does uh, EJ fit into those plans? I think it's, first of all, remarkable that we still have that many talent as deep into the draft this year. Yeah. A lot of picks, that being said, and also very defensive. Uh, they're probably bound to move out one of their picks, either Obalambo or uh, their current starting center, Jaden, and I'm going to butcher the name. Um, yeah, okay, you, you took the burden off of me, and I won't complain. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they won't be really be able to share the court, even though it would be best for RKC because having a defense first and an offense first player on, on the floor at the same time would be a match made in heaven. Yeah. So we will see how this works out. Yeah, and uh, David Smith, in a way, also is in the mix. Uh, well, not necessarily in the mix because they don't overlap in positions. Like you said, you can't have uh, yeah. two center only players. But yeah, I think. It makes sense why a center-only player would fall as well, because it has less optionality as maybe a power forward slash center has, but the ceiling may be higher. Then with the 15th overall selection, we have Chet Hologram uh, out of the Thunder Bay Resistance, another center seven foot one uh, of the Kuzi player agency. A bit more offense to hologram last season in the SPDL scored well over 30 points, I believe. Yeah, it says <laughs> there actually 32 points per game and was a big part of the resistances um, rummaging through the league as they ended up with the number one seed. Uh, also, let's also a bit more quiet. Uh, like I was talking about earlier about the Maras with the battalion. Uh, Ocelots had a strong 52 win season last or this previous ended season but were also bounced out in the first round they played in the playoffs so they received Danny Williams in trade last season and had Max Holzer on the team last season then you also have forward options in McGrath and so forth so uh, where does hologram fit uh, is it just competition with Danny Williams or is one of the two going to start this season, what do you think? I think one of the, those two has to start unless they sign someone in free agency. Um, 
beyond that, I think it's a sign that Mexico is preparing its next generation. They already traded for a couple of youngsters. They have a couple of youngsters on the roster now. And Hologram could fit in there as their center of the future. What I would like to see from him is to either go fully into the defense category or put up some some muscle to truly make that offense work. Because while it worked in the SBDL, I'm not sure if he can keep up those the shooting numbers um, and scoring numbers in the SBA as it is right now. Yeah, and you can certainly see the true shooting in the SBDL wasn't over 60 either, whereas for uh, Holy Clarkson it was somewhere around 60, for Volcano Sharp, well actually for Sharp it was lower, but for Lamarque, who am I thinking of? Oh, it was the... Uh -huh. The, 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 Bagwell had around 64. Yeah, because ba Bagwell right. had like 65 because it was all the 50% <laughs> three-point shooting. So yeah, maybe the 58% true shooting is not actually that bad in general. But like you take like six percentage points off that when you go into the SPA. It's definitely not the same and poss possibly even worse with that uh, much athleticism so far. So yeah, I think if you want to be uh, a like a new style on offense even you have to get up some of the athleticism to score better best of luck to chat in mexico and we'll move on to some real trades here the prowlers are receiving a 17th overall selection in exchange for their first round pick two seasons or two drafts from now i think it's pretty straightforward you still have some decent players on the board as of now and in 81 it's uh, possibly too difficult to tell the future or especially for some a franchise as volatile recently as philadelphia and then uh, you might have noticed the 16th overall is next but the, the trades are in disorder because the aviators are now receiving the 17th overall selection actually yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, from the Prowlers, who just, uh, with a filler, moved up one position to 16th. And yeah, I think this is just like making sure you get the player you want now. And if uh, Charlotte wasn't too keen on selecting uh, imperatively one of the other, uh, we'll just see who the Philadelphia... Whoop! <laughs> Apparently the Aviators were an imperative on... Who they're gonna pick so they're moving the 17th overall pick one step further to mexico city for uh, a young player in kuma and giorno giovanna uh, filler so finally we'll see the draft board here so prowlers are selecting next and then it's ocelots and then the rest of the board as is as stands Benson Royal at 16th overall selection going to the Philadelphia Prowlers. So, yeah, still we're at over 440 DP and it's a center slash power forward uh, of Ben's player agency. Uh, yeah, I think Philadelphia just took the best player available that's possible here and it's a good one for them. It just reinforces the idea from before where they selected um they Lamar Cage was the yeah, last Lamar one. Cage they selected. So it's just now you have doubled up on the center slash power forwards and should be looking at a very strong future. Yeah, and as we said a couple picks ago, it's a match made in heaven if you have a defense and an offensive first player. And then yeah. we mentioned how Lamar Cage can be molded into Eva right now because he's balanced both. And with Benson Royal being an offense first player, uh, as it is very evident here. Especially from the numbers, very solid scoring from him for the Barons last season. Um, then I think the roles should be pretty, pretty clear if you are Philly's management to push those guys to develop one on the offense and one for now majorly on the defensive side. And maybe they can dominate this way uh, very soon. Yeah. And even if it takes four seasons instead of like two, uh, then eventually you're going to have two very well-rounded uh, center slash power forward players, which would even be a further blessing, really. But yeah, it remains to be seen. And uh, I think it's a very good pick, all told, for Philadelphia. Very good uh, in sniffing out this uh, 
getting this pick on board and picking up Royal. At the 17th overall selection, we have Mexico City selecting Will Cloud, a Trifectus point guard player, a strong playmaker with almost maxed out uh, passing and, uh, abilities and with a bunch of quickness and stealing and handling the boot. Uh, do you like this sort of player type just as a baseline sort of skeleton to go into the league? Yes and no. I think having a very strong passing focus is great to get the ball to your guys and playing some good defense on top of it. Maybe a little bit less specialization would be better because then you can round out some other um, dimensions of your game which helps the team winning. But for now, I think great pick and Tree and Guzzi are known for wanting to play together. So for yep. Mexico to be able to snack both of them is definitely a, a great sign. Strong playmaking, but there's not yet much else, which is a good starting point, but it's still only a starting point, I think. Then, uh, like you possibly mentioned or forced so there, Jaden Chabarkaba is headed to Philadelphia for the 18th or uh, for Obadiah Christ with the 18th overall selection. Uh, Christ, a I think an underrated player these past two seasons in Philadelphia. Do you think uh, Rampage got him for cheap here, possibly? Hmm. I'm not sure if necessarily cheap because we still have some promising talent on the board. Yeah. So you could have picked someone up here. I'm also not entirely sold on, on Christ being on the rampage. I don't see the necessity to go for someone who's more like a win now type of player than to accumulate other assets or young talent that you could get to win in maybe a couple seasons. So not sure what i think as of now let's see what's behind the door 18th overall selection then uh, the philadelphia prowlers are selecting will knock uh small forward slash power forward out of the jerupa valley jackals a kind of an interesting player build where you have a lot of or a lot where you have some of everything more or less a strong scoring or strong rebounding uh decent defense decent scoring but maybe not necessarily the x factor yet uh without any proficient super proficient talents what do you think about will knock i mean one of our few first gen talents in this draft i think he can develop into a great player but he will need some some good guidance because as you said right now he's a bit all over the place beside the rebounding. There's nothing that really defines him where he is real, really good at. And um, to help him build out, okay, what do you want to be good at? And how do you get there? Will be crucial for him in the next few seasons. Best of luck to Will Knock in Chicago then instead, as the Prowlers are sending uh, him to Chicago in exchange to Stanley Licht. Uh, Licht also was sort of stuck in Chicago where he's a promising young player but there's not necessarily always been an avenue to play consistently with Paul Morphys and Tiny Congos and then that sort of players. Uh, Licht was starting these past two seasons but maybe if Chicago want to instead actually I'm not sure if it makes maybe it's just for the small forward position because they now have a lot of players acquired in this draft episode what do you think about the uh, trade here yeah so Licht hasn't been developing for a while now um, sorry isn't that sky high potential youngster that you had two seasons ago but he's still very solid especially for his, his pay wage so I think this is a win for the Prowlers here because I see Will Nuck as a younger, less refined version of Licht, and I'm not sure if he will reach those same heights, especially in the same time. Yeah. Um, so right now, pure upgrade to have Licht on the roster instead of Nuck. Yeah. Um, but time will tell if, if Nuck will be able to overtake him with some hard work. All right. 
Uh, 19th overall selection, the Thunderbirds are selecting Benjamin Abenduck. Uh, Schnee, uh, player agency, a center slash power forward, 6 foot 11. Uh, currently, strong investments in defense and three point shooting, even at this center slash power forward position. Uh, wasn't very effective in the seasonal stat line, but I think that's more due to the re rolls that were happening rather mm. than. Uh, what you see on the attribute diagram here what do you think about toronto now adding a young player with a lot of defense to their team they could use anyone pretty much yeah i think last year we were egging on toronto for not keeping the the first overall pick and taking Tsukushima or whoever else yeah um i think this is a step in the right direction adding a defense to first guy or someone who is very active so far um, and could be very promising. I think this is an absolute steal to have your at pick 19. Yeah. Um, so good luck to to Abenduck in Toronto. I think he has all the tools to, to make it far. Yeah, and playing time should be plenty about in Toronto, even in the immediate. So congratulations on your actually getting a team and player fit both ways. The Brooklyn Bullets are receiving Las Vegas' future first rounder in exchange to the next and final pick of this draft, the 20th overall selection. Uh, yeah, I think empty for 20th overall is how I'd characterize this. Because next season, I don't think the Las Vegas Jokers pick is going to mount to anything if or much, if anything at all. So, let's see. Uh, Jerome Wade selected as the final pick in the first round here to the Las Vegas Joker. So, pets, small forward slash power forward out of Louisville Lions. I think will provide a nice depth, depth, depth instead of fillers on the reigning champions. Do you have any thoughts on this uh, player diagram? small forwards, less powerful with a lot of passing. I think the only thing that I would usually expect from someone to Joker's pick up is that he plays no defense. Mm -hmm. So that's surprising. Um, but he's still young. He can develop it and hopefully be, in, be an asset for them. I think not much more to say at this point. Yeah. I think if you can just hold down a position and get like minutes every game, I think it'll be very fun to win a lot of games in Las Vegas next season. So all in all, pretty good. So here is the full uh, draft results for 2000, 2000. <laughs> I guess it's like 2082 in the SBA. So yeah, to season 79. Let's see if everything's here correct. Looks to be all the logos are correct. Philadelphia with three players, Chicago with two players and uh, well, Philadelphia only with two because they uh, traded three. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to Chicago for one. Yeah, so yeah, that's why I was thinking. So Chicago with three players, basically. Uh, what What do you th think is the key story here? Uh, no Houston, not necessarily Jokers other than this one. And I think no... Oh yeah, there is Vice. There's... Uh, uh, Kalo Kida picked up there, but no Los Angeles Rush in the draft, no Pittsburgh Iron. Well, actually, yeah, that is too, but eighth, Dennis Chamberlain. There's very little of the high end teams or the top four teams in the of the league last season. So, it, does this seem like more of a standard draft where you have the sort of worst teams picking <laughs> good young players instead of good teams picking? Good young players with the worst teams picks and they're struggling for air. I think it's two main stories for one. Uh, I am not sure if everyone is aware of it, but the cap was heightened a bit last, or for the, effectively for this season, it was decided last season. And I think we are seeing the effects where contending teams are not trading into the draft with assets to to pick up a youngster who fits their play style really well um 
because they can rather use this asset in itself because they have the cap space to keep them or to maybe attract free agents that want to keep the cap space open for that one, which helps them more in winning. And I think the second trend is we have, and I can't stress this enough, a lot of big men, talented big men coming into this draft um, with this draft class. And it's going to be interesting to see how it shakes out. You maybe slumps a bit, who rises and falls, but if this trend continues, we could see a real logjam at the big man positions, um, which can be very interesting to maybe some people get more intrigued to move around because at their current team, their positions are, are full. Uh, but it will be a real dogfight um, in their prime years to see who will be the best of them. Yeah. How do you feel about this lack of guards and this influx of, of big men? I think it's very interesting because we had teams who already had like stacked front courts, at least stacked in terms of like numbers, uh, still selecting players just because they are uh, high value targets. But they immediately sort of like drop down in value because instead of a highly sought after draft prospect, they become bench players on a team that's maybe not that good. So. And then you also have teams like Arizona, where you already have like three players uh, to play the positions, and they're just not, they're just staying away from the draft completely. Actually, Arizona has like five players. Well, yeah, still, regardless. It's uh, going to be very difficult for a lot of people, and I feel like I didn't want to make a shooting guard player originally, because I just wanted to make a power forward slash center uh, again. To have a good time, but I felt I feel like I wouldn't have had a good time even if I made a Hall of Fame, fame level player this time for a power forward slash center position because there'd be so much competition not only around the league but even within your own team where you might just play the 32 minutes a game. Like it's going to be very difficult for some of these players uh, to get their footing before the previous older guard uh, starts to retire or players with positional versatility get sent down to the smaller positions back so like players like well i guess rashida Ryder, that sort of stuff but there's not that many of those examples who are small but play in the bigger position maybe so it is interesting all right, two quick questions before we go, or did you have anything else to add to that? No, I don't think All right. a lot to add here. Who would you have picked first overall? Mm, difficult to say without team fit, because I think we have a lot, lot of great folks here, and I think... Well, I guess if you had absolute... the Vancouver Wolverines, for example, where you have nobody. If I have the Vancouver Wolverines, then either your guy as they actually picked it up or david smith jr because he's a guy that you can pair with absolutely anything that comes in the next couple of years be that scoring stars be that defensive center only players or whatever he gives you a lot of versatility and a great all-around guy to to build around yeah I what's think, your pick uh, i think i would have picked uh just without any sort of interpersonal relationships, I would have picked my own player. But if that's <laughs> excluded, <laughs> I would have picked maybe one of Holly Clarkson, Lamar Cage, or David Smith Jr. I think those are like uh, some of my favorite people and have made uh, good players in the past. So why not? And then the other question, uh, we always do this apparently, uh, who's the future Hall of Famer in this draft class? Ooh, that's a tough one. Because so much hinges on your, especially with this draft class, who is going to be in the right position with the right team when it comes time for the big time. Yeah, awards. year six, year seven, year eight. It's going to be a yeah. real dogfight. I will say for now... Okay, you have to remind me again. How do I pronounce your player's name? <laughs> well, we can do it this way. Uh, you can read it out loud and then I can edit it out if it's like 
silly. No, I mean it's it's fine. I just want to know. Oh, I mean, uh, it's I'm not a real name. English... <laughs> Neil Mayer Rockwood, and then yeah. I'm going to to Englishize it. But yeah, okay. yeah, that sounds that's fine. kind of wrong. Yeah, um, I guess it's a joke uh, on uh, Finnish words, so it doesn't really make sense uh, in any language. Okay. 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 Yeah, I think you have the best shot because simply you have the least competition. You have a chance to get a lot of stats early on now with Vancouver. And um, that's usually a recipe for success. Yeah. I think dark, well, not even dark horses, but I think one of the two Mohol players, if they play a real career and a full career, could be the likeliest. And then you also have so much depth, like DJ Obalambo could be a future Hall of Famer. Uh, like, yeah. even like Benson yeah. Royal could be a future Hall of Famer. So it goes up and down all the way until like, you know, I guess like 17th or at least the top 15 where you can have... Maybe even 19th. I mean, yeah, Evan Duck is a first gen, but at a very high earning rate. And we have seen first gens stand out from the crowd before because they were in the right situations like yourself back then with Harkerwood. Yeah. So even though you were selected a bit higher up. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but then it was... Different times. All right. Uh, with all that said, thank you everyone for listening, watching, listening and watching, watching and listening. Uh, I know it's been a very long episode, but we also had a very, very, very many high quality players here. Uh, I'm going to do my best to make this a viewable and listenable experience that everyone can enjoy. And uh, thank you as well to Nepto for providing meaningful insights to almost, if not all, players selected today. Yeah, thank you for you as the, as the big host and the moderator and presenter. I don't know, can we call you associate commissioner for announcing the picks now? Or... Uh, I don't know what the... I guess I would just be the master of ceremonies, really. Like the... whatever. Present. Yeah, presenter is more apt because I have no charge. I, I don't take charge over the process itself. Whereas... That's like the shadowy figures behind closed doors. Anyway, you can find out more about the shadowy pictures for mess uh, if you message uh, any of the light blue named characters on the SBA forums or the SBA Discord. Tell them I sent you and you have a lot of questions they need to answer. For example, why do the Houston Ravens win championships when I'm the league simmer? Why does the salary cap keep raising up even though the league is very lopsided at the moment? Why, why, why? Just present all your questions to any SBA or SBDL commissioners who get a lot of fun interactions that way. And in terms of the entry draft, we'll see you again uh, in about six weeks' time for Season 80 SBA Entry Draft. Thank you, Nepto, and thank you everyone for listening.